In the history of literature, I can't think of any book franchise celebrated as much as Harry Potter. Even people that haven't read the books or seen the movies still know the story about the boy who lived. Harry Potter has become an iconic figure and has become a household name. So I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you know a little bit about the plot and about the characters. So obviously there will be some spoilers. Brilliant. I've read the series a thousand times, and even after that, I still pick up on new details every time I read it. J.K. Rowling is a phenomenal writer, and you can tell how much she cares about this series based on how much detail she puts into each aspect of the book. There's so many imaginative creatures like Acromantula, the Basilisk, Blast-Ended Scroots, Grindelows, Pixies, Nifflers, and Dementors, which Dementors were actually created to represent Rowling's real-life struggle with depression. Everything went cold, as though all the happiness had gone from the world. There are also some creatures that were already created in ancient folklore, but Rowling turns them into her own original creations, such as dragons, centaurs, hippogriffs, and elves. And of course, there's all the incredible magical places she created, like Hogwarts, Diagon Alley, the Ministry of Magic, Hogsmeade, St. Mungo's Hospital, and so much more. And it all takes a life of its own. She brings all those places to life through her incredible writing. She even makes fun of the common people of our time, showing wizards and witches doing things in plain sight of muggles, and muggles not noticing a thing, showing how consumed we are with ourselves, and these days with technology. One of my favorite aspects of this world that she created is the sport Quidditch. She was able to explain an extremely complicated game as the game was in progress, and still managed to make it extremely exciting. It's simply brilliant. And of course, let's not forget about the characters she created. Every character has such rich detail in their background and story. It's truly amazing how much she knows about each character that she created, even if she didn't incorporate it in the books. You could honestly write a whole book series on each individual character in these books because there's so much to go on. She has meaning behind a lot of their names too. For instance, Lupin, as in Remus Lupin, means wolf in Latin. Bellatrix means warrior. Severus translates to strict, stern, grim, and terrible. Voldemort means flight from death, which is his biggest fear in life. And there's meaning behind almost every name. There's so much more. Rowling is truly a genius to come up with all of this. My favorite character by far is Tom Riddle or Lord Voldemort. I just find him so fascinating. I'll talk about that later on. With so much detail put into these books, it's no wonder the series has such a big fan base. It's outrageously large, and the number of spin-offs and attractions based on this series is overwhelming. Especially recently, with the new spin-off release of The Cursed Child that has fans going crazy. Of course, there's also the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Universal Studios. There are a ton of video games, not to mention the millions of dollars of merchandise based on the series. But arguably, the biggest and best thing based on these books are the eight feature films, which is what I'm going to be talking about in this video. I'm going to go through each film, dissect it, and compare it to the books. But first, let's look at the book series as a whole and see what makes the series so amazing. One of the great things about this series are how there are so many common themes throughout the story most notably being the power of love defeats all. It's what saved Harry's life when his mother sacrificed herself to save him. It's what drove Snape to devote his life to Harry's well-being, even though he hated him. And it's ultimately what made Harry stronger than Voldemort in the end. And there's so much more to it than that. There's a theme of love throughout each book and every plotline, driving the characters to do what they do. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to cause you any more pain. I care too much about you. There's so many other themes throughout the series, like the rule of seven. Seven books, seven years of Hogwarts, seven Weasley kids, seven Horcruxes, seven people attacked by the Basilisk. The first book was released in 97, the last in 2007, and many more. Standard Book of Spells, Chapter 7. Seven muggles. Each team has seven players. There are seven secret passageways out of the castle. And there's so many other themes like courage, family, friendship, loyalty, death, and so on. One of my favorite themes in the series is how it takes real-world problems and adapts them to fit into this wizarding world. There's a lot about racism and slavery. This is very prominent with the species of elves in the series, who are used as slaves and are sworn into one family throughout every generation. The three prominent elves in the series are Dubby, Creature, and Winky. Dubby being the most prominent due to the fact that Harry tricks Lucius Malfoy into freeing Dubby. Hermione also started an association called SBEW, which fights for the rights of house elves. All of this is mirroring the fight of the mistreatment and freedom of African American slaves in the 1860s. And let's not forget about the superiority of purebloods. There's some wizards, like the Malfoy family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. Also, the use of the word mudblood, referring to wizards that were born from two muggle parents. It means dirty blood. 
Mud Bud's a really foul name for someone who is muggle born. Let's get started with the film series. Daniel Radcliffe took the role of Harry Potter, Rupert Grant took the role of Ron Weasley, and Emma Watson took the role of Hermione Granger. The three have amazing chemistry in real life, and it really shows on camera. The adult cast of the series is something to marvel at because it is outstanding. They got the likes of Maggie Smith, Richard Harris, Alan Rickman, Ralph Fiennes, Gary Oldman, Alina Bonham Carter, David Thewlis, Jason Isaacs, and so many more. All of them being phenomenal actors and very well respected in the film industry. They all mentor the kid cast due to the fact that they all had very little acting experience. And it's very apparent that these kids were challenged by the more experienced actors. Ready to work with children that were younger than me and less experienced than me and Daniel stepped forward and he said don't worry I will be and at that moment I thought it's not a kid that's a 13 year old actor and one thing that they did that is very hard to do and the other movie franchises fail at is that they kept the exact same cast throughout the whole series of course the exception being Dumbledore due to Richard Harris's unfortunate passing who was replaced by Michael Gammon with such a kick-ass cast, the first film was off to a very good start for the series. And the director chosen for the film was Chris Columbus, who would direct the second film in the series as well. The fact that he not only had to direct a big budget movie that had so many fans already, but also teach the younger actors basic acting skills, he did a great job. The film set the groundwork for the series and was a huge success. One thing I liked about the film versus the book was that in the film we start from the point of view of the wizards, whereas in the book we start from the view of the muggles, specifically Vernon Dursley. In the book we watch Vernon as he watches the strange wizarding things going on, and he has no clue what it all means. There's also great comedy in this film, and it was executed very well. I'm going to bed before either of you come up with another clever idea to get us killed, or worse, expelled. She needs to sort out her priorities. They did a great job adapting the book to the big screen. There were a few things I wish that they hadn't cut, however, such as the midnight duel where Malfoy sends Harry into a trap to get caught by Filch. I thought it really developed Malfoy's character and made you hate him even more. Another thing that they cut out, which actually leaves a pretty big flaw in the script, was Snape's potion obstacle to get to the Philosopher's Stone. Which is all okay, it's fine that they cut that out, but they still mention in the movie that Snape is one of the people guarding the stone. Snape is one of the teachers protecting the stone. He's not about to steal it. So they tell us about that, but there's no such proof of that. Another thing that isn't so much wrong with the film, but actually the book, which I know is very rare, but they put so much emphasis about not going into the Forbidden Forest. But the Dark Forest is strictly forbidden to all students. But then they take Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Draco in there as a punishment with Hagrid. And not only that, they let Harry and Draco split up from Hagrid. It just doesn't seem very smart or logical. Also, some of the CGI effects were not that great, and even Chris Columbus himself had said that he was unhappy with some of the scenes, such as the ghosts and parts of the Quidditch match. The effects for Fluffy, the three-headed dog, looked great, so why couldn't they do the same CGI for these things? Now that I've given you what I thought to be the flaws of the film, let's talk about my favorite parts. The scene with the Mirror of Eris said, which is actually desire backwards, was very touching and powerful, especially considering how little dialogue there was. The score written by John Williams really makes the scene, along with Daniel Radcliffe's performance. The chess match was beyond amazing, and really made Ron's character more rich with detail, and it finally gave him his moment to shine. The first film was very good, and definitely set the stage for the rest of the series. The Chamber of Secrets, the second installment in the series, was released one year later, and had all the same cast and director. We got a lot more detail about the Wizarding World in this film. We learn more about the founders of Hogwarts and the different houses, and we learn a lot more about Tom Riddle which I was very excited about because he is my favorite character. We also learn about Hagrid's past and how he was expelled from Hogwarts. And we finally see the burrow where the Weasleys live, which really brought the book to life. It's not much, but it's home. I think it's brilliant. It's also interesting to see how normal wizarding families such as the Weasleys live their lives. Your sons flew that enchanted car of yours to Surrey and back last night. Did you really? How'd it go? Oh, oh, did you ever... I mean, that was very wrong indeed, boys. Very wrong of you. We're also introduced to multiple new characters in this film. There's Lucius Malfoy, Draco's father, played by Jason Isaacs, his house elf Dubby, who I mentioned earlier, Colin Creevy, and Gilderoy Lockhart. Unfortunately, Lockhart would not return as he did in the books, where we see him in a scene in St. Mungo's Hospital, which is a shame because that was a great plot line. We also wouldn't see Colin Creevy again, who actually died in the last book at the Battle of Hogwarts. This film, like The Philosopher's Stone, is a mystery-based story. This one is more of a classic murder mystery, and we slowly learn who's petrifying students, which gets very interesting. 
they find out that if you look at the basilisk, you die. But since no one looked at it directly in the eye, no one died. They were just petrified. Which, in my opinion, is a bit of a stretch, but whatever. You can really tell how far the kids have come in their acting ability, especially Rupert Grint. He's a great physical actor in this film. The expressions he makes are priceless. Can we panic now? Christian Coulson, who plays Tom Riddle in this film, was outstanding and perfectly captures Tom's fake charm and his evil manipulative ways. He manipulates Harry and Ginny beautifully throughout the film. It was Ginny who set the basilisk on the mudbloods and Filch's cat. Ginny who wrote the threatening messages on the walls. Why? Because I told her to. I find I can be very persuasive. And Coulson really brought the character alive. I think he's far better than the actor that they got for the Half-Blood Prince. One thing I was upset that they cut out was Draco and his father in the store at Borgen and Burke's. You really see how his father bullies him, and we see why Draco is the way he is today. Fortunately, there is a deleted scene of this, but I would have preferred to see it in the final film. Now let's talk about the ending of this film. It is literally the corniest ending to a movie that I've ever seen. There's no Hogwarts without you, Hagrid. After directing the first two films, Chris Columbus said that he couldn't do it anymore, especially with the passing of Richard Harris, a good friend of his, and who he handpicked to play Dumbledore. He said it just wouldn't be the same. The studio went with a new director for the third installment in the series, The Prisoner of Azkaban. They went with Alfonso Curion, who was known for more artsy films and less big budget ones, so many people were surprised when he signed on. There's definitely a different style to this film that the other ones do not possess. Whether that's good or bad, I can't say. It's much more artsy, which was expected of course because it is Alfonso Curion. He let the kids do their own costumes and let them do whatever they want with their style. He also did a lot of a different type of filmmaking that had not yet been seen in the Potter films so far. Curion also did a lot of no-cut scenes that probably tested the kids and ultimately made them a lot better actors. Daniel Radcliffe especially blossomed in this film with some intense scenes in which he had to reach a certain level of acting that he had not yet gotten to. He was that friend! I hope he finds me. Because when he does, I'm going to be ready. When he does, I'm going to kill him. They changed locations for the Hogwarts grounds, which are very noticeable, especially Hagrid's cabin. They also changed the entrance of the Gryffindor common room and changed the fat lady's personality entirely. Password. Gary Oldman makes his first appearance in the series, and I'm a huge fan of his. Radcliffe actually said that while working with Oldman, his performance actually gets better. The two best performances that I've given in these films so far are three and five, you know? And I think that is in part to do with the fact that I have Gary Oldman around at the time because I learned so much when he's around. Oldman was very much of a role model to Daniel Radcliffe, and scenes they shot together in not just this film, but the other ones as well, really reflects that. What if after everything that I've been through, something's gone wrong inside me? What if I'm becoming bad? You're not a bad person. You're a very good person who bad things have happened to. David Thoulos, who plays Remus Lupin, also makes his debut and is outstanding as well. His conflict with being a werewolf is one of the most interesting aspects of the film. Unfortunately, they cut a lot out of this film, and in my opinion, some of the things that they cut out were some of the best parts of the books, the biggest being the Moritors. The Moritors in the books were James, Harry's dad, Sirius, Lupin, and their friend Peter Pettigrew, who was also introduced in this film. They all became animaguses, meaning that they could turn back and forth from animal to person. They did this while they were students at Hogwarts so that they could be with Remus Lupin while he was turning into a werewolf. None of that was included. The only thing that they did include was the Moritors' map, and it actually falls into Harry's hands. So you mean this map shows? Everyone. Everyone? Everyone. Where they are, what they're doing, every minute of every day. Brilliant. They mention the names of the creators of the map, but they don't mention that it's James, Sirius, Lupin, and Peter. Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. That was arguably one of the best parts of this book, and they just cut it out. Another thing that they cut out was Gryffindor winning the House Cup in Quidditch. It was a very exciting sequence in the book. One huge flaw in this movie is in the first scene, Harry's using magic outside of school, which is one of the worst things that a student in Hogwarts could do, and they say nothing about it. Lumos Maxima. In the book, he's just doing homework, and he's not using his wand. Hermione also uses magic outside of school in the Chamber of Secrets when she fixes Harry's glasses in Diagon Alley. 
In this film, there was also a lot of slapstick comedy that I wasn't much a fan of. At one point, the slapstick ruins what could have been a very creepy scene with Professor Trelawney. She has a vision and uses her creepy voice, and the scene had potential to be very scary. Then, they throw in a gag of her choking at the end in a comedic way. Tonight, he who betrayed his friends with hot rocks with murder shall break free. Innocent blood shall be spilt, and servant and master shall be reunited once more. Also, Dumbledore, the man who's supposed to be the smartest and most powerful wizard there is, and here he is being stupid and hitting Ron's broken leg. It's very out of character, which I didn't really like. Now, after all those criticisms, some things that I did like. I love the time travel scene. It was actually done better in the film than in the books in my opinion. I love how their actions play a part in what they do. For example, Hermione throwing a rock to get their attention. Whereas in the book, they just watch themselves and play no part in what happens. Here, they make their own destiny when they go back in time, which I found very interesting. I also love the additions of the talking heads on the night bus. Yeah, take it away, Ernie. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Rowling even said that she wished that she had thought of that first. I also love the way that they animated the Dementors. They were so elegant but frightening at the same time. After this film, Alfonso Curion decided to decline doing the fourth movie in the series, The Gobble to Fire. So instead, they got Mike Newell to take over. This is by far the longest book of the series thus far, and Newell actually recommended that they split it into two parts, but ultimately they just stuck to one part, and because of that, a lot got cut out of the film, probably more than any other movie in the series. In the book, the first chapter gives you insight into how Voldemort went back to kill his father and his new family, and that was one of my favorite chapters in the whole series, so I was a little bit disappointed that they removed that from the film. Another thing that they removed was the Quidditch World Cup, which was a spectacle to read in the books. The disappointing part is that they did a great job leading up to it in the film, and it gets you super hype, and then you think it's about to start, and bam. They just get rid of it completely. However, I can understand why they cut this, but come on, we couldn't have just seen like one goal or something? Some other noteworthy things that they also cut out are Winky the house elf, Dubby, Hagrid being a giant, S-P-E-W, Rita Skeeter's secret of being an animagus, and a ton of serious black scenes. He only got a very small cameo, and we could barely see his face because it was etched in the fire. I found this disappointing because I would have loved to see more of Gary Oldman in the series. This book took the series in a much darker and more serious direction. We are introduced to the Death Eaters, who were Voldemort's minions. We learn about the three unforgivable curses, the Killing Curse, the Torturing Curse, and the Manipulation Curse. We see the first real death in the series, Cedric Diggory played by Robert Pattinson, and who nowadays is most known for playing Edward in Twilight, did a great job, and his death is one of the most heart-wrenching things you'll ever see, especially his dad's reaction after seeing how close the two were leading up to that. That's my son! That's my boy! Because of this, it was the first PG-13 movie in the series so far. We also find out about the terrible fate that Neville's parents went through. There were five huge main events that happened throughout this film. One, the Quidditch World Cup, which I already talked about. The three tasks of the Triwizard Tournament. And finally, the graveyard scene. The second and third task were both very well done. The second task was also groundbreaking for being able to use CGI underwater which had never really been done before to this extent. The third task was by far the best, and was another thing that was actually done better in the film than in the book in my opinion. In the book, they're creatures that they have to fight throughout the maze, but here, they're no creatures, and it's more a psychological thing. People change in the maze. Oh, find the cup if you can, but be very wary. You could just lose yourselves along the way. It's almost as if the maze is alive, which was really cool. These two tasks were great, but the first task, not so much. To me, it was played out way too far. I wish they could have just had Harry fight the dragon in the arena. It would have saved so much time for other details in the books that I mentioned were cut out before. Also, did the dragon die and land somewhere on the grounds of Hogwarts? <laughs> Who has to clean that up? And if he's not dead, the dragon tamers have to go look for him and hope that he didn't escape. And if it did escape, that's a big problem for the Ministry of Magic. The whole thing was just not well thought out. Another huge flaw that affects the whole series is the use of Polyjuice Potion in this film. In the Chamber of Secrets, when they use the Polyjuice Potion, their voices don't change. Bloody hell! 
We still sound like ourselves. And the same goes for the Deathly Hallows Part 1 when they break into the Ministry of Magic. But here, Barty Crouch Jr. is disguised as Mad-Eye Moody throughout the whole film, but he has Mad-Eye's voice rather than his own, so it just doesn't line up with the other two films. The final graveyard scene is really what makes the film. We finally see Voldemort's rebirth, and he's played by none other than Ralph Fiennes, who is a phenomenal actor, and he really brought Voldemort to life throughout the rest of the series. The boy who lived. How lies have fed your legend, Harry. They decided not to go with the red eyes that he had in the book, but I'm very glad that they kept the snake-like nose because his snake Nagini played a big part in making him return. The final fight of the film shows Harry and Voldemort dueling it out, and Harry's parents even came out of Voldemort's wand and save his life, and every time it gives me chills. Harry, when the connection is broken, you must get to the port key. We can linger for a moment to give you some time, but only a moment, do you understand? Let go. Sweetheart, you're ready. The end of the film really sets up a whole new direction that the series is going. Everything is going to change now, isn't it? Everything is changing, and they're preparing for war, which brings us to the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth installment in the series. If Voldemort's raising an army, then I want to fight. Mike Noah would step down, and David Yates would take the director's chair and would remain there to finish up the rest of the series. In my opinion, he did a phenomenal job, especially with the Order of the Phoenix. This was actually my least favorite book of the series, and it actually happens to be my favorite film in the series. So that really shows how well Yeats adapted this one. A ton of characters from previous films come back, such as Lupin, Sirius, Mad-Eye, and the whole Weasley family to form the Order of the Phoenix, which is a secret society to fight Voldemort and the Death Eaters. There are also some new faces in the Order, such as Tonks and Kingsley. By far the best new character is Bellatrix Lestrange, a Death Eater played by Helena Bonham Carter. She was absolutely magnificent in this role. There's also Luna Lovegood's introduction, played by Ivana Lynch, who literally is Luna. Unfortunately, all my shoes have mysteriously disappeared. I suspect Narvals are behind it. This film is also Dolores Umbridge's debut, and she is awful, and you honestly hate her more than Voldemort. You deserve to be punished. We really see Harry's character blossom in this film, as he becomes a teacher to the army that he and company had made, called Dumbledore's Army. Every great wizard in history has started out as nothing more than what we are now, students. If they can do it, why not us? I think this is Dan's best performance in the whole series, and I think a big part of that is that he works so closely with Gary Oldman in this film. Radcliffe really takes the character in so many directions in this movie. He goes from being depressed, hopeful, courageous, stupid, and extremely angry when he starts merging his mind with Voldemort's. Look at me! The editing in this film is absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> It's done by Mark Day, who works on every film that David Yates directs. One fall that I noticed that isn't so much in the film, but actually in the book, is the sudden appearance of the Thestrals, which can only be seen if you've witnessed death. Harry can't see them until this film because he had seen Cedric Diggory's death in the last film. But didn't he see his mother die when he was one years old? So he's seen death before, so why couldn't he see it the four years before this? Another thing that was disappointing was that they cut out Neville's scene at St. Mungo's Hospital, where we see his parents who are tortured into madness. 14 years ago. She tortured them for information, but they never gave in. It's truly a tragic part of his character development to see him talking to his parents who are basically vegetables, especially considering the fact that they were such heroes and never gave in to the torture. They do touch upon this a bit by mentioning it later, and we see Neville get upset when Bellatrix, the person who did this to his parents, escaped from Azkaban. But I think it would have been a very great scene to put into the film. They also cut out the whole aspect of Neville possibly being the chosen one rather than Harry. And speaking of the prophecy, I think that the way they reveal it in the film is much better than they did in the books. For neither can live while the other survives. The final act is once again what makes the film so amazing. When they go to the Ministry of Magic, we see the Order take on the Death Eaters, and then we see Voldemort and Dumbledore, the two most powerful wizards in the world, duel. It was foolish of you to come here tonight, Tom. The Orders are on their way. By which time I shall be gone, and you shall be dead. Then we see a super powerful scene where Harry defeats Voldemort with the power of love. You're the weak one, and you'll never know love or friendship, and I feel sorry for you. The whole finale was perfect. They cut out all the right things, and they left all the right things in. And it really shows how much they put into this whole sequence. It's thrilling, emotional, scary, and epic. And it's definitely one of the best parts of the whole series. The final line of the film leaves you satisfied, but it still leaves you wanting more, which is absolutely brilliant. But even though we've got a fight ahead of us, 
We've got one thing that Voldemort doesn't have. Yeah? Something worth fighting for. The Half-Blood Prince was by far my favorite book in the series, probably because it focuses so much on Voldemort and his past as Tom Riddle. I was pretty disappointed when they cut out a lot of the flashbacks, but the ones that they did put in were great. In the book, we see how manipulative he really is, and we see how he uses his charm to get whatever he wants. Rowling said that she based Tom Riddle on Adolf Hitler. Both were raised around the people that they despise, whether that be the Jews or Muggles, and both ultimately trying to cleanse the world of those people. To her, the mixture of magical and muggle blood is not an abomination. Both were able to change their emotions in a second to get what they want from others and manipulate their way to power. Both were on a quest to not just get to the highest point of the government, but to turn it upside down and make it their own. They both felt superior, whether that be to the Jews or to the Muggles. Another huge similarity is that the Snatchers, who work for Voldemort, wear red armbands that bear a close resemblance to the armbands that Nazis wore. There's so many more similarities, but let's talk about Voldemort for now. In the first vision of the book, we see his mistreated mother, Merit P, who lives with her father and brother. They were poor, but with great heritage, leading all the way back to Salazar Slytherin himself. They lived next to a rich Muggle family, whose son's name was Tom Riddle. Merope falls in love with him and forces Tom to fall in love with her by using a love potion. They conceive Voldemort under that love potion, which is actually the reason why he can't comprehend love, which I found very fascinating. Anyway, back to the film. The flashbacks in the film were very well done, as I said. I think that the young Tom was a little bit better. The young Tom is actually played by Ralph Fiennes' nephew, which really gives him the resemblance of Ralph's Voldemort, and both give outstanding performances. Through all of these visions, we learn about Voldemort's ultimate secret, his Horcruxes. These are objects that mean something to him, that hold a part of his soul, which is what kept him alive all those years ago in Godric's Hollow. Now about Harry, we see that the phrase the chosen one has been given to Harry because of what happened in the Ministry of Magic at the end of last film. We also see Malfoy struggle as he's also chosen, only he's chosen by Voldemort to kill Dumbledore. Tom Felon really steps up and steals the show. He gives a phenomenal performance. I have to do this. I have to kill you. He's gonna kill me. Michael Gambon also gives his best performance of the series. This is especially prevalent in the cave scene. Don't make me so Daniel Radcliffe has said for years that he hated his performance in this film, and we just recently found out why. He admitted that he had a drinking problem at the time that they were working on this film, and he said that he would often show up drunk to shoot scenes. That came as a big shock to fans, but even so, most people agree that his performance, although not the best, was still pretty good. On top of all that dark material I just mentioned, we actually have a pretty lighthearted movie compared to the other films. This is largely due to the fact that there is so much focus on relationships and couples. Ron and Hermione's relationship finally starts to blossom, and so does Harry and Ginny's. However, Harry and Ginny's relationship was beyond awful in the films. Everything was just so awkward and forced. It's even worse than Anakin and Padme in Attack of the Clones, which is saying something. Here everything is soft. And smooth. Their relationship was so well done in the books, and honestly, it was one of my favorite parts of the series. But here, it's just hard to watch. Shoelace. Don't you trust me? Another thing that I didn't like was the attack on the burrow over Christmas break. The scene was not in the book, and it really didn't add much to the film at all. And I would have much rather seen another Tom Riddle scene rather than this. Maybe we could have seen Tom interact with his uncle or grandfather, or see him use his charm to get Hufflepuff's cup. Overall, I thought that the film was pretty good, but I think that they could have balanced the humor and lightheartedness with the dark stuff a little bit better. The film ends leading us right into the Deathly Hallows journey. It's finally time for them to go out and hunt for the Horcruxes. I don't really think you're going to be able to find all those Horcruxes by yourself, do you? They finally decided to split the film into two parts. From here on out, every series that's based on a book series splits their finale into two parts. I guess Harry Potter just started that trend. The first scene with Rufus Grimger, the new Minister for Magic, gives a very powerful speech and makes you see that nothing is the same. These are dark times, there is no denying. Our world has perhaps faced no greater threat than it does today. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are out of their element and out on an epic journey. No more Hogwarts, no more Dumbledore. Nothing is the same, and no one is safe. One scene I wish that they hadn't taken out was Harry and Dudley saying goodbye on good terms. Once again, there's a deleted scene of this, but again, I would have rather seen it in the final film. Since this is the final chapter of the series, there is a lot of nostalgia. 
One example is when Harry picks up the knights in the cupboard under the stairs. He was playing with those same knights in the very first film. Because his book was split into two parts, there are very few exciting moments. The big things are the seven Harrys battle in the sky, which was very well done. Leading up to that, the CGI was well ahead of its time and was executed very well, especially with Daniel Radcliffe's performance of each character. Harry, your eyesight really is awful. The next exciting part was breaking into the Ministry of Magic, which was also very well done. This is completely mental. Completely. The world's mental. And finally, the last big thing was the duel at Malfoy Manor. The rest of the film is very slow, which isn't always a bad thing, but a lot of times it is. There's a lot of sitting around and talking, and it gets kind of boring, but at the same time, there were some things that were slow that were still very good. Most notably, the tale of the three brothers. The way they went about that was very original, and the animation was really well done. Bill and Fleur's wedding was also a great slow scene that I really enjoyed. And I don't know why, but the music playing kind of reminded me of Titanic. This of course is the first time we see Bill Weasley, and he's actually played by Brendan Gleeson's son, who played Mad-Eye Moody. Now we've seen all of the Weasleys except for Charlie, which was a little disappointing, but he was mentioned a number of times throughout the series, however. My brother Charlie works with these in Romania. Brother Charlie had to bring him over from Romania. There's also the smallest cameo possible, if you even count it, in the newspaper when the Weasleys went to Egypt. You don't even see his full body, you just see his head poking out. All of the performances in this film are very good, but the actor who steals the show in this one is Rupert Grint. The Horcrux really gives him loads of emotions. But don't expect me to be grateful just because now there's another damn thing we've got to find. When the Horcrux is open and it starts messing with Ron's head and showing him his worst fears, his reactions were tremendous. Dobby makes his return for the first time in the film since the Chamber of Secrets. For people that haven't read the books, it's been five movies since they've seen him. Whereas in the books, we've seen him in every book since the Chamber of Secrets, minus the Prisoner of Azkaban. So I wonder, will the people who have only seen the movies feel as much when Dobby died as the people who read the books? Dobby is happy to be with his friend, Harry Potter. One mistake I noticed in the film was they show a quick flash of Harry's parents being killed by Lord Voldemort. This is while Harry is looking at his destroyed house. The mistake is, it should have been the handsome Tom Riddle, but instead it's the snake-like rebirth of Voldemort, who didn't even get reborn into that body until many years after that. Another complaint I have is the chase scene in the woods. They used way too much shaky cam, and it looks awful. You can't even tell what's going on half the time. It's so wildly filmed, it's ridiculous. The final scene in Malfoy Manor was very well executed, and I get chills every time I see Hermione post-torture with mudblood carved into her arm. The final scene of the film ends very abruptly as Voldemort gets the Elder Wand, leaving us on a cliffhanger, almost like a drama show. Fast forward 8 months and The Deathly Hallows Part 2 was released. Part 1 was the road movie, and now we move on to the war movie. This movie went beyond my expectations. Everything was riveting. Really only two events happened in this movie, but they were both done so flawlessly. They break into Gringotts and the Battle of Hogwarts. The sequence where they break into Gringotts was really well done, and their escape on the dragon was epic. Leading up to the Battle of Hogwarts in the books was the introduction of Albus Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth, and the story behind their sister, Ariana, and the love between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. It was all set up with the cave scene from Half-Blood Prince, and in part one, the story behind their father. The family moved there after his father killed those three muggles. <laughs> It was quite the scandal. They also showed the book of Dumbledore's life, showing pictures of Ariana, Dumbledore, Grindelwald, letters that they sent to each other, and there was even a picture of Grindelwald in Bathilda Bagshot's house. And on top of that, we even see him stealing the Elder Wand. The pieces were all there, but they just didn't put it together, which was very disappointing, because Dumbledore's backstory was so rich with detail in the books. The scene in the Room of Requirement was also sort of iffy for me. The CGI for the fire looked great, but when they start flying on the broomsticks, it just looks awful. A big budget movie like this should not have effects that bad. But anyway, some good stuff about the film. Neville Longbottom has come full circle and has become a total badass. Yes! You and who's out me? He's out there leading the battle and taking huge risks to help them win. Hurry's hot dippy for us! For all of us! And I think it's awesome that Matthew Lewis, who plays Neville, in real life parallels the character he plays from going to a dorky fat kid to becoming a good looking guy over the course of 10 years of shooting Harry Potter. Ron and Hermione finally get together, which was so satisfying. <laughs> the battle itself was so well done. There are awesome explosions, all sorts of creatures like giants, acromantulas, dementors, 
some awesome slow motion camera work, and there's a great sequence when Harry, Ron, and Hermione have to make their way through all of that. One of my favorite parts of the film is when Harry reveals himself and confronts Snape about killing Dumbledore. Tell them how it happened that night. Tell them how you looked him in the eye, a man who trusted you and killed him. Snape's character development is one of the prime focuses of this film. We of course see The Prince's Tale, which is fantastically put together and edited. It really makes you look at Snape's character in a whole new light, and we see that everything he did was for love. Really? After all this time? Always. There was so much loss in this film, so many characters we love gone, and the scene that really gets you is right before Harry gives his life, he's back with everybody that he loves. Stay close to me. Always. Until the end. The final fight between Harry and Voldemort is a bit played out, but in the end, once we just get to the simple duel, it's very well done. The final two scenes of the film give you so much nostalgia, as you see the trio holding hands as they look into the distance. And then 19 years later, as the final frame fades out, Harry, Ron, and Hermione smile, watching their own kids go on to their own adventures. The Harry Potter series has thrived very strongly for the past five years, well after the final movie was released. People thought that the Harry Potter hype would die down after the Deathly Hallows was released, but clearly that's not the case. The stories we love best do live in us forever. Harry Potter will live on forever, with the fans who celebrate these amazing books and movies until the end of time. Whether you come back by page or by the big screen, Hogwarts will always be there to welcome you home.